Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about how the tides work on in the oceans. Um, and I'm doing that partly because so many of the explanations you see, especially on the web, are wrong. Um, and the ones that aren't wrong are actually still misleading very often. And so I have an interesting challenge to show, something, show how something can be correct and yet misleading. So let's get started. So it's all about gravity, of course. Well, what you need to know about gravity for this video is just two things. One is it follows an inverse square law. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that the force between two particles is proportional to both their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So it gets weaker as they move further apart. And the other thing is that if you have two objects, well, they're sort of in orbit with one another, so they're far enough away from everything else that nothing else matters much, um, and they're, so they're in orbit around one another. Well, they're not really. They're in orbit about their common centre of mass. Now, let me show you that in the case of the Earth-Moon system. So I've got quite a few geogebra apps here, um, and most of them are nowhere near to scale. This one actually is, so, which is why the Moon's so small. So this is the Earth and the Moon in orbit. And what they're actually, the, the, the moon is not orbiting the Earth. What it's orbiting is the center of the mass of the system, which is that red dot there. And you'll see the Earth is also orbiting that point. And meanwhile, of course, the Earth is spinning about the center, the black point. So the Earth is managing to spin about that point and orbit that point. And that's such a confusing situation to get your head around, but I'm not starting with that. Um, you probably know that the tides are caused by both the sun and the moon. And the moon is the bigger effect and therefore more important. Uh, but on the other hand, the sun's a lot easier to understand. So let's start with the sun. So here we are. Um, here's the Earth spinning and orbiting the sun. Now what we have to do is work out what the forces are on the ocean that cause the tides, and then work out how the, how the oceans respond to those forces. So we start with the forces. Now quite a few explanations that you see um, quietly ignore the fact that the Earth is spinning. Um, well, it turns out that's okay, actually, because the spin doesn't affect the force field. Um, but I don't think that's entirely obvious, and so I'm going to try and show you that it doesn't affect it rather than just assume it. So for the moment, um, here we are looking down from above the North Pole on an Earth, and I'm going to assume there's no tilt in the axis at this point. So we're just looking down from the North Pole, and the Earth is spinning and orbiting the Sun. Right, so the first step is actually to abolish the Sun completely. So now the Earth is just barreling through space and spinning. Um, and I think you'll agree there'd be no tides then. Um, so travelling in a straight line is, according to Newton, just the same as standing still. So um, it's just spinning and, and there's, no, there's no tide. Um, if we take a particle on the equator, um, it is accelerating, of course, towards the centre of the Earth with this acceleration where because of the um, uniform circular motion. So little omega here is the once a day type ro rotation and little r is the radius of the Earth. So there must be a force doing that, um, and there it is, and that must be its weight minus some buoyancy, upthrust, if you like. Um, and that looks the same wherever you are on the Earth. But there are no tides. Right, now let's put the sun back in. And what happens, of course, is the Earth is now going in orbit rather than travelling in a straight line. And if we think about the point at the centre of the Earth, for example, that is now accelerating towards the centre of the sun by this amount, which is omega squared r again, this time omega is the once a year type thing, and r is the um, distance from the centre of the sun to the centre of the earth. Now, crucial point is, because the earth is a solid body, a rigid body if you like, um, every particle in the earth must have exactly the same acceleration, because otherwise it would come apart, and it isn't doing. Right, so they all got the same acceleration parallel to the line of centres and the same strength. So if our particle on the equator had that same acceleration, there would still be no tides. There's nothing um, moving this, this point of water relative to the Earth. However, the force it receives is this, which is directed towards the centre of the Sun. Let's look at the difference. I'm, I'm assuming a, a particle of mass 1, by the way, so that forces and accelerations are on the same scale. So when it's cl uh, close to the Sun, um, the force is bigger than required, as it were, to keep it in step with, with the rest of the Earth. Over here it's smaller. Um, here um, and everywhere else it's pointed towards the centre of the Sun rather than parallel to the line of centres. And so the difference between that and that is what causes the tides. If these were the same there would be no tides. That's what causes the tides. So let's look at that. Um, so it's towards the Sun here. It's away from the Sun there. It's 
into the earth there and there and in between um it's horizontal parallel to the surface of the earth there and there and there and there and that's going to be really important later so that's the force field there it is follow the red arrow as it goes around right now it's worth looking at the size of these things so g the acceleration due to gravity uh, is about 10 meters per second squared right um, the acceleration towards the center of the earth due to the spin of the earth is about three percent of that a lot less um yeah, and yes it really is true if you stand on the equator you weigh three percent less than if you stand at the north pole um the acceleration towards the center of the sun the same order of magnitude a bit smaller but now look at the tidal force absolutely tiny less than a millionth of a meter per second squared okay so we've got a task on our hands to work out why such a tiny force can do anything at all really right now let's um get rid of this assumption about um the direction of the earth's spin and what have you um so and and the particle being on the equator so there's just any old particle anywhere on the earth um the plane of this picture now is the plane that has that particle in it and the center of the earth and the center of the sun the earth is spinning about some axis or rather um but it doesn't really matter when we abolish the sun um there's some accelerations going on and stuff's happening um when we put the sun back in well it's all still happening it's just the same the only difference is now the whole ex the whole earth is accelerating in this direction and that with that strength and this particle has this force so the net force on this particle here is this which is what causes the tides so let's just look at um, a three-dimensional version of that there it is um, so that's what the force looks like in three dimensions um, your force field and the spin of the earth is completely irrelevant okay now I'm going to go back to two dimensions though because that's rather a um, confusing picture so let's look at this force field in a bit more detail um, you will see websites that say that force causes the tides just that one well rubbish some will add that one still rubbish some add that one and that one still rubbish and the reason that's rubbish um, is that these forces are as we've seen tiny and they are vertical so what earth can they do in the way of causing a tide think about this one here so it's as though this part this patch of water here suddenly became less dense than water in general by about one part in 10 to the 7. well what's that going to do nothing really um i reckon it would raise the water about a hundredth of a millimeter or something like that now vertical forces can't hack it that's not what's going to happen what matters is all the other ones going around here in fact let's put the whole force field in it's really these horizontal components um, that cause um, that cause the tides and more generally the, hor the horizontal components of all the forces that cause the tides now I've got a nice little Fermi estimation to show how these forces tiny though they are can produce reasonable tides right so we've seen that the, the water in the ocean has this acceleration effectively horizontally um, so the whole ocean with all the fish in it all the ships on top all of that the whole lot is accelerating with this tiny acceleration but it goes on for quite a long time um, for about three hours so it's a 12 hour cycle isn't it so roughly speaking it goes one way for three hours and nothing much happens for three hours three hours back the other way so we can say it's going accelerating in the same direction for about three hours which is about 10 to the four seconds now all students know uh, the formula for working out how far something goes if it's subject to a constant acceleration for a period of time and it's this a half at squared well it is ignoring any initial velocity our particle might have if you plug the numbers in there you get 50 meters so well yes if you moved it took the atlantic ocean and moved it 50 meters our way that would cause a reasonable tide wouldn't it right so let's now go back to this picture um and so now you see why um i think this picture which is very widespread although it is correct that is the force field it is misleading because it makes it look as though these forces we are which are indeed the biggest and the most important um whereas actually they're completely irrelevant what max what matters is the horizontal components it's these ones here that really do all the work okay uh, well that's the sun now we've got the moon in um as i say understanding what's going on in the moon is a bit difficult uh, but it's essentially the same so let's not go through that um it's twice as strong roughly 
So that's what the moon does. The whole system's linear, so we then add the two together. That's the moon and the sun. And now we can see how the tides depend on the phases of the moon. So um, if we move the moon here, the sum is much smaller. Um, and so the tides are bigger at new moon and full moon than they are at the half moon. That's the neap tide and that's the spring tide. OK, so that's the force field. Right now then, um, how do the waters respond to that? Well, almost all the pictures you see say that what happens is that. And that is absolutely not what happens. It is, of course, what would happen if the Earth were not spinning or were spinning very slowly, because then the waters would indeed stretch out like that. But it is spinning and we really can't afford to ignore that anymore. It has a profound effect on what happens. So this is quite a widespread phenomenon. In fact, what happens is a bit more like that. Uh, really? Yeah, really? OK, now this is a widespread phenomenon. Um, so I'm going to, seeing is believing, I'm going to show it to you in a different context. And then we should look at some maths and then we'll come back to this picture. So let me stop sharing. Right, so I have here a pendulum. And I have a metronome and I've set it up to the natural frequency of my pendulum. As I can get it. Right, now I'm going to force this pendulum using my hand. Um, and I'm going to force it, start with slower. So this metronome is set to 116. So I'm going to slow it right down to, what should we do, 96. And I shall force it at that speed. Now you see what's happening is, it's roughly what you'd expect, isn't it? The pendulum is moving in time with my hand and in phase with my hand. And that when my hand moves left, the bottom moves left and so on. OK, now instead of slowing it down, I'm going to speed it up from 116, let's say, to 136. And now what's happening? Well, it's still in time with my hand, but it's moving in the exactly opposite direction. When my hand moves left, it moves right. A bit like kids, really. If you push them gently, they do what you want. If you um, push them too hard, they do the exact opposite. OK, um, so let's now go back uh, and look at some mathematics. Uh, don't worry if you're not too familiar with this sort of equation. It's called a differential equation, um, and it describes the movements of what's called a forced oscillator. So it's things like a pendulum that's being pushed around. Um, we'll concentrate on the graph. Um, so omega naught here is the natural frequency of our pendulum or oscillator or whatever it is, and omega is the frequency we're pushing it around with, the forcing frequency. And what we have here is the response. Um, well, it's the response, I say steady state response. It's a response once a thing settles down, because um, if you start pushing it around to begin with, funny things happen, but eventually it settles down. So green is the driving force and blue is the response. K, by the way, is the friction or the damping, and I've set that to a very low value to begin with. So I've set it up initially with um, omega naught, that's the natural frequency, being bigger than the forcing frequency. So in this case, we're forcing it slower than its natural frequency. And here it is, the response is in phase, just what, you, just what you'd expect. Now let's move to a situation where we're forcing it faster than its natural frequency. Well, no, behold, it's out of phase. Look at that, exactly out of phase. That's what the pendulum does, that's what the mass does, and the mass is right. OK, so that's interesting. Now then, let's go back to here and, um, oops, and put some friction in. So in this case, um, in the in-phase case, um, if we increase the friction, what happens? Well, the response gets smaller for one thing, but also it moves right, uh, I later in time. Well, that's sort of what you'd expect, isn't it? So this friction, it slows it down a bit. Well, I don't know. That's what you'd expect, I suppose. Anyway, let's look at the other situation when it's out of phase. Uh, when we increase the frequency, it does exactly. Well, it's getting smaller again, but it's moving left this time. Look, start again. It goes left. In other words, it's catching up. That's, well, that's surprising, isn't it? OK, we'll need that later. So now um, the question is, is the response of the water like that? Or, oh, or like that. 
Well, in fact, of course, it's not going to be anything like either of those things because, um, well, there are continents in the way, for one thing, um, and the um, uh, just in, in fact, it's an amazingly complex setup. So we have to simplify it a bit. And I'm going to make the simplifi simplification that Newton made. So suppose that um, we didn't have any continents and we didn't even have any oceans. All we have is a channel running around the equator. And we'll suppose the equator is um, uh, parallel to the orbit of the moon as well. So um, everything's, everything's flat and as simple as we can possibly make it. So we've got a channel around the equator that's four kilometers deep. That's the average depth of the oceans. And it's a bit wider than that, say 100 kilometers or so, but around the equator. So then, um, well, this isn't quite a forced oscillator, is it? Um, because this is a, let's put this, get this moving again. Um, this is a traveling wave, um, not a standing wave. Um, but um, it's really, it's really pretty much the same math. It's really exactly the same math, actually. Um, so we have to work out then whether this, um, whether we're forcing this faster than its natural frequency or slower. Well, what do we have here? Well, it's a tsunami, isn't it? It's a tsunami racing around the earth, well, racing around our channel. So how fast do tsunamis travel? You know? Well, it's about 800 kilometers per hour, which is fairly fast, jet plane speed. Uh, but it's nowhere near as fast as this, is it? Because that would take about 50 hours to get right round the Earth, whereas we, these waves are getting round in 24 hours. So we're forcing it much faster than it wants to go. So, yeah, it really is doing that. It's out of phase. Well, except that if we put some friction, oh, if we put some friction in, uh, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to catch up. So instead of being here, we can imagine that High tide is sort of six hours after the moon is overhead. It's going to be more like four or five hours after the moon's overhead um, with the friction in. So that, that's really more like the picture that we should be drawing. And now if we think about a slightly more, a, a less simplified Earth, even if we imagined um, channel, lots of channels around the Earth, uh, one for each latitude, it would still be very complicated because the the frequency of this tsunami varies. In fact, if we even got far enough north that um, the uh, tsunami could get right around the Earth in 24 hours, that channel would be in resonance, wouldn't it? And the water would splash all over the place and empty the channel. And further north, it would be in phrase. So it's ever so complicated. Add to that uh, the tilt of the axis and water swirls around over the, all over the place. Put in the continents as well, and the whole thing is completely unrecognizable. There's no way you can really tell what's there's no way of looking at the data and confirming that this is really what would happen. Okay, so let's um, summarize. Um, so the summary starts with the forces, and, and the key point is that the whole Earth accelerates like this. Our particle in the ocean has a force like that. The difference is that, and that gives you the force field. Um, the resulting force field looks like that. But we have to remember that it's really only the horizontal components of these that cause the tides. Um, and the response to that uh, does, depends critically on the Earth's spin. So I've said in a frictionless equatorial channel, it would be out of phase like that. And high tide is six hours after the moon is overhead. Um, allowing for damping, it would be more like four hours. So there we are. Hope you enjoyed it.